can you please first share how does one become master of perfumery? How is it possible? Is it like a skill that you are born with or is it something that you can learn with time? How does it happen? Because as far as I understand, you have super sensitivity towards understanding the smells around. I would say it's exactly, it's exactly like music. So you can say uh, some people would learn faster than others. And you can say that some people, they don't practice enough. Some they learn faster than others. And then they have to practice, practice, practice. Uh, even Mozart, he, was, he had already practiced a lot by the age of 10. That's what people forget to say. Uh, he was a genius as a, as a kid, but still as a genius, he had to practice a lot. And it's the same in perfumery. It's really like painting music, poetry. It's really like painting music, poetry. It's really, really uh, the same. And then just the one difference is there are about like two schools in the world, two and a half. <laughs> and uh, so it's very hard to find formal training. In any case, you have to learn with uh, some other master perfumers. As perf junior perfumer, you have then to practice with master perfumers. Usually it takes like three years of school, another two, three years before you become a perfumer. More like in music, you know, how long does it take you to be a musician, like a writer, you know, you write one chapter or one paragraph, you're a writer, but it's after writing and writing and writing that you can start making a difference between big advanced writer, a hobby writer. It's the same, just like in music, really, really, really similar. Unlike music and unlike writing, music, you just need your instrument and writing, you just need a pen and paper or your computer, right? You need mostly your computer, a pen and paper, and then at one point you need some materials. So we need that. That's my piano. See? Oh. And these are all one note. And then I have the fridges because I have fragile ingredients. You see here, this is the fridge. So you see, this is a whole box of roses right here. You mm -hmm. see that? Yes, That's yes. Just, just roses in there. And then I have oranges, look, a whole box of oranges right there. Uh, and then I have a second fridge for more ingredients also, jasmine and lemon and lime and, and everything. A normal piano has 88 keys. There I have about 1,300, 1,300 keys. Oh. And they're all notes and then you have to compose. Uh, in one fragrance, you can have very, very, very short formulas. It's like 10, 15 ingredients, but very often it's 40, 50, let's say very often 30 to 60 ingredients. That's totally common. So voila, and then you have to compose with these things. I've heard that musicians can hear music. How does it happen with you? We deal with uh, ingredients and chemistry. The nose is chemistry based more than physics. The eyes and the ears are physics based. And in physics, you can predict things because the systems are quite simple. If I, if I drop this pen, I guarantee you it's going to go this way, clack, you see? So in music, you can predict, you can already see in your head or you can sing a new, a totally new song in your head because you know very well do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And then when you mix do with la, it still remains do and la. When you mix lemon with vanilla, the lemon does not remain lemon really, and vanilla does not remain vanilla, and then depending on which lemon and depending on the proportions. So can you imagine, depending on how many do's you have in your music, the music sound, the do sound all of a sudden like far. That's why I always say that if you cannot smell a smell you've never seen before, and I know some perfumers, they say, I had the smell in my mind, and if they say that, it's because they've seen the combination already before. But you cannot predict what a brand new combination is going to smell like because even the, the biggest computers don't know what is going to come out of a mixture. Like in rose, you have 150 molecules. In lemon, you also have more than 100 molecules. In coffee, they say it's 900 molecules. The systems are much, much more complicated. And this is scientifically proven. The nose can detect many more things than the eyes can see colors. So if you can see, let's say, 100,000 shades with your eyes, you can see a million or 100 million different smells with your nose. It's much more complex. You cannot predict, so that's why. So we try, we smell, 
we trash. We try, we smell, we trash. So that's the one difference. Christophe, when you find a new smell, how do you extract it? If it's something weird, like, I don't know, a smell of, of an animal, or maybe it's just something you feel at this particular place. Is there a way to somehow extract it from the air to get it? Yeah, so we so we we you can analyze with your nose and when you can smell and then you go back in the lab and with different ingredients but similar smells. Even if it's an animal outside, we have ingredients that are animatic. We have ingredients that are going, we have a big, big range of things that people don't even know because what you see on the market is very, 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 very filtered. People have no idea we can do also very strange smells, but we can without killing the animal, without extracting the animal. But so you go and smell. So already with your smell, you can recreate things. So it's like with your eyes, you can, you can paint something. We also have a small machine that can analyze the air. And that can also help us for different purposes or in different situations. Or, but we have, it's a small device and it can tell you what's in the air. But it is not like photography. Huh? When you then analyze the device, some notes are missing because the nose is more sensitive than the device. Or some notes that the device sees, we don't have in the lab. So then you have to find similar smells for a note that found in nature or in animals that, as I say, we don't have. So you have to, the reconstitution is a very tricky part, but we do it often. So basically right now we have like 3,000 notes, right, in your piano. You can find about 3,000 ingredients in perfumery. Yeah, 3,000 different ingredients easily. But I would say it's like an architect. You select the ones you like or you need. And me, I need a lot. A lot of perfumers, they create with 500 ingredients. But I need a lot. Some perfumers even create with 300 ingredients. That's fine. But there are some styles you cannot do or some things you cannot do. Yeah, I, I like to create for a lot of different styles or a lot of different people or brands or projects. So already with brands, I do men's and women's, I do shampoos, I do candles, I do a lot of different categories. Some perfumers specialize themselves in one or two categories very much. Actually, most of the time, that's the case. They specialize in, in some, but I like to do, and I've learned for a lot of categories that I like to do for all these categories. You should know, even if you, the shampoo you use to wash your hair or your laundry detergent have a smell, and it's also created with these ingredients, also has a formula inside. You have like 40, 50, 60 ingredients in one shampoo formula or in one uh, detergent formula. So in Ariel, I don't know what you have in uh, Russia. Do you have Ariel in Russia? Yes, we, we have yeah. it. Yeah, voilà. So uh, voilà. next time you smell Lenore or next time you smell Ariel, you have perfumers there who create fragrance formulas. It's the same way. So then also me, I do a lot of things for museums and art galleries. And I show in art galleries and in museums as well. And so this is also another style of perfumery. And uh, I need a lot of ingredients for that because I also do weird smells. I do a broad range of things. I like to do flowers and woods and spice. So I, I need a lot of ingredients. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've read on your site that you also give lectures at universities sometimes. Usually these are one-off lectures. Huh? So I teach people uh, or it's, uh, it's like a speech or, or lectures, but I teach people how we create a fragrance. People have no idea. And so if I talk to, like at Harvard, I was talking to music theory students. So then I do a lot of comparisons with music and then they understand. I do a lot of comparisons with music. And then if I teach once I taught also at Harvard, I was more to the architecture group, design group. Graduate School of Design, GSD at Harvard. So then I do a lot of comparisons with the architecture world or with paintings or, or with building things. Because we also say we build a fragrance. We can do a lot of analogies for people to understand. Or if I sometimes I give lectures at the neuroscience department that was at Columbia and at NYU, then I do a lot of, uh, I, I show different things, how the brain functions, 
or how we think about olfaction as perfumers because we are the only one smelling, 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 smelling every day, except sommeliers maybe. Sommeliers also have to smell a lot, but otherwise there are not many professions where people smell a lot of different smells every day. So it's very unusual. And so we have a brain activity that is very unusual. We do a lot of pattern recognition. We don't think we have a logic because perfumery is also like music, you know, music is art and science. Right? Music is also physics. You don't escape the laws of physics in music. You don't escape the laws of chemistry and physics in perfumery. So there is a logic, but our logic is not linear. And our logic has a lot of different parameters. In music, they have two, three parameters. It's actually very simple. The physics of music is very simple. The chemistry of perfumery is very complicated. We have thousands of parameters, literally thousands. And so the perfumers, we do a lot of pattern recognition more than linear logic. Mm. So when pattern recognition is very unusual for people and it's scary for management <laughs> because it's not linear. So it's hard for managers to make decisions or it's hard, we cannot predict. The, the logic is hard to put on paper. It's mathematics too, but it's, as I say, pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. Christophe, I would like to ask you, can you give some examples how smells, fragrances influence our brain, what can happen when we're put under certain circumstances where we have to inhale certain smells? I understand that it's used as a marketing tool right now, but uh, can you please share how we can use it in everyday life? Like maybe it can allow us to be faster in a way or to wake up quicker, things like that. So you mentioned so many things here. So number one, so for marketing, I always mention it's no more, no less than having a nice picture in a store. Huh? So a scent is not like a drug uh, that makes you do things you don't want to do usually, okay? It gives you a certain emotion, a certain feeling, but just like a music or just like a nice decor in a store. And so then you still decide if you want to buy or if you don't want to buy. Huh? But otherwise, yes, the sense will influence you about the quality of things, about just mood and for the brain. But first of all, the sense in the brain activates connections that are not activated by uh, music or by vision. So that means you, are, you become more intelligent if you smell than if you don't smell. Just like you become more intelligent if you listen to a lot of music versus if you don't listen to a lot of music. So it creates new connections, which is healthy for the brain. Smell has connections in the brain that all the other senses don't have. All the other senses function in a certain way and the sense of smell function in another way, meaning you really open new areas in your brain when you smell that you cannot open with words, you cannot open with sounds and you cannot open with the light. Scent also deals a lot with memory, so people know that. You recall memories better, longer, more precise, etc. And if you think about it, memory is intelligence. What is intelligence? Intelligence is when there is a new situation, you know what to do, you know what to say, you know how to behave, you know how to solve the problem. How do you know how to solve a problem? It's because you've learned things. And how do you learn things? It's memory. <laughs> and intelligence and memory are like this. And scent and memory are like this. People, children, older people, adults, everybody should smell much, much more. It's good aerobic for the brain. And then the last thing I want to mention is that you will open with smell. You will open emotions, but also memories that you cannot open with words. And the psychologists and the doctors as well, and the patients or the witnesses by smelling things would recall things that about your childhood, about an event, about something that they won't recall by talking to them for three hours. It is really the biology how we are. So people should smell much more. You should smell also before choosing things. Before choosing things, smell, smell, because you will get information you won't get by just looking at it. So how is it important to be able to see and how is it important to be able to hear? How important is it to be able to touch? You get a lot more information. I've read your manifesto. You shared that people in general should be educated more on smells, on fragrances. And I totally understand you because I'm like 32 
and I hardly know anything about smells, about fragrances. I can understand the difference between the major smells that surrounded me in Russia and Ukraine when I was growing, but not the advanced one, for sure. You also tell in the manifesto about Osmotech, I think it's called, a place in France. Yes. I'm I giving know. a big presentation in Paris on Wednesday. That's one reason I came back here. I have a big Osmotech presentation on Wednesday. 200 people talking about actually this one, the movie thing, but also about other things, of course. So they preserve fragrances that have disappeared, but they, it's like a repository. They're really an archive uh, so that we keep all these smells forever, <laughs> ever, ever. I'm interested. What what are the oldest perfumes that they store? Do they have something like from the 1700s, something like that? Yes. It's two different things. Some oils are old, but they don't have oil from 1700. Their function is actually to try as much as possible to actually get the exact formulas and to recreate the smell regularly according to the original formula. It's not like they preserve the cake. From 1700, they get the recipe of the cake and they make the cake fresh regularly so that people can smell the cake they can eat or they can smell the cake regularly. That's how you should see it. And in July, I had a presentation in front of 800 people in Paris also, by coincidence. I finished a bottle from 1921 from Coty, the ship by Coty. I finished the bottle. It's not like music. You can play Mozart and Beethoven over and over and over. You're not using the music. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, destroying the music each time you smell. That's a big problem with perfumery. Each time you use the art, you destroy the art. Ephemeral. It's like it's not like dance, but it's also an ephemeral art. You have to make it fresh all the time, and so that's why the Osmotech does. They don't have so many old bottles, but they have recipes from 1700. The oldest recipe they have is from 1300. Whoa. And then they have actually one from, uh, I think it's minus 40, but they don't have the exact recipe. They have the composition of the ingredients and then they remade the recipe. So they don't have the exact quality. So it's not rigorous. So that one is from the Roman time. Then the first formula they have is from 1300 and then they have a few from 1700 and then they have many from 1800. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Formulas in those days, were they complicated? I would imagine they would use something like a smell of a rose. No, it was already complicated. They had already like some formulas on one page. So that's already 20 to 40 ingredients. The thing is they have infusion of rose, infusion of violet, infusion of uh, musk. That's from the musk deer. You have to kill the deer. So there are some formulas, they are stuck because they don't know how to get that mask because we don't kill the deers anymore. So some formulas, it's a trick to remake them. Some formulas have molecules from the 1800 that we don't make anymore. So the Osmotech since last year has a new convention with the University of Versailles to reconstitute molecules that we don't make anymore so that they can reconstitute the fragrances. It's very complicated. You know, some pigments, if you're in a museum, some pigments for certain paintings or for certain buildings, we don't make anymore, you know? And the museum has a problem finding the pigments, the colors that they were using at the time, like the Egyptian. So it's a bit the equivalent. How do you remake those notes? And it should be much, much bigger as an institution, but the France industry supports very little of these things. I'm very upset because they support much more cancer research. The France industry supports much more cancer research than they support this kind of initiative, you know? I think we should put a lot of money in this kind of thing, and they should put much more money in universities. You know, uh, L'Oréal, they put much more money in medical things that are unrelated to perfumery than they put money in perfume education. And that's not right. I'm sorry, I totally respect cancer research or any kind of research or whatever. I think we should put as much money in education. As you said, it's not normal. Look, you know about music, you know about painting, you know, you have no idea about perfumery. That's not normal. It's crazy. It's crazy. In America, there's not one perfumery school. Can you imagine? In the not whole much. of the United States. And you can put Canada and Mexico together. In the whole of Northern America, there is not one perfumery school. 
Can you imagine that there would not be one music school in the whole of America? This is crazy and not one painting school. And when they say, yes, there is one at FIT, it's the Fashion Institute of Technology. They learn how to do uh, perfume marketing uh, and in a very traditional way, but that's fine. But it's not a perfume school. It's not a perfume composition school. Three years and you get the best student. Out. There's nothing, nothing, not one perfume school. And the two schools in France are private school. They are not really in the official school system. Like, I don't know, we are behind, we are behind. Christophe, so when you said that there are two and a half schools, you meant that two of them are in France and a half is in U.S., so this marketing no, department. Two and a half. <laughs> I said two and a half. The half is, it's a school. I respect them very much, but the program is nine months, you see. It's called the GIP, Grass Institute of Perfumery. It's not really a school because it's nine months. It's one year program. They also have one or two weeks program. But you see, it's like I would tell you, you have a music school, it's one year. No, what do you do in one year? I mean, and, and do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. It's eight notes, yeah? See, that's how much music I know. But at least it's eight notes that you have to learn first. And then you have the flats and the sharps. So maybe it's 32 notes. Ooh, 32 notes. We have the first year of perfumery, you have to learn 600 notes. First year of perfumery, 600. Frankly, uh, well, that's why I say it's two and a half because uh, I like them very much, but I cannot say it's like a real chemistry school or a real music school. The other two are, one is in three years and one is in five years. What do you have in Moscow? What is it called? Polytechnicum of Moscow or this very famous university there you have? Well, that's not what we have in perfumery yet. The school in Paris is more serious, but we need we need much more. I really dream of uh, someone making a movie where the investigation goes also about smells, and that's true. And so you have smells that are not biodegradable. So I'm thinking there are some some things maybe where everything is gone and yet they are still the smell. So a dog or a human, because we can smell certain of those things very well, some of those molecules are strong, you could do a whole plot with that. Or with the smell, you could give some clues to the judge or to the, the police to investigate this and that where they did not think of investigate as well, you know? So, um, you could make a difference between two twins with the smell, not the smell of the person, but they may have worn two different things. There was a case in Germany where a twin attacked a jury. The police could not prove if it was this twin or that twin that attacked the jury because you cannot tell which one it is. They had to be in the they cannot put one in prison because there was no way to show which one it was. And there could be some very interesting plots, you know, uh, maybe just because one was wearing one smell and not the other one, it could have been true for because uh, you could have a smell in your skin and then you analyze the skin of one and then you can prove that or you analyze the smell of the clothing of one. You know, they can wear the same clothing, but if they have a different cologne or a different smell, Yes, we could do this. Smells could should be used much, much more. There is actually a TV series in Russia called The Smeller. It's uh, about oh, a detective oh. guy. Yes, it's it was really made here. It's about a detective who solved uh, different cases this way. So maybe you need someone to translate it from Russian into German oh, really? or French or English. Yes, it actually exists. Oh. This is interesting. You see, we don't even know. Is that a new series or it's been a while or what? It's been a while. It exists for a couple of years already. If you want, I can find it and send you a link. Maybe one day you're going to watch it. I would watch, but it's only in, in Russian, right? Yes, unfortunately, right now it is. I don't know yeah. how good it was, but anyway, I will send you the link and you're going to check it. It's smelling, I can see how they visualized the things, maybe. How do you see the world around you? I mean, do you perceive it through smell? Do you perceive your friends through smell and your dog? How do you feel? What is the major thing for you? See, it's interesting what you say. I don't have good ears. I cannot sing, I cannot repeat a song, but 
I'm very visual and very tactile. When I watch something, I don't imagine the smells. I don't think of the smells when I watch. Like right now, I'm, I'm watching across the street. See that view. Uh, I'm, I'm street level, and that's the view. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. There's an upholstery uh, store. There's a clothing store. There is a tree. And when I watch, I don't think of the smell of the tree. I don't think of the smell of the baroque store. I don't think of the smell of the cars. I never watch a landscape that way. I don't know if perfumers do that. I've never, actually, I've never heard of someone doing that. Because you don't have the smells in your nose. I think it's like if you're watching a car and you don't see the driver through the windows, you don't imagine the driver inside the car. You don't look at every car. Imagine you see the cars with only black windows, okay? You don't imagine the different drivers in the different cars when you watch the cars. I don't know anybody doing this. When you look at a house, you don't imagine the people behind the house. Unless I'm asking you to do it, you just see the house. And it's the same with smells. I, when I watch a landscape or I watch the street, I never imagine the smells there. Now, if I'm in a place where there is a smell, then I notice the smell, yes. I notice the smell as fast as I notice what I see. I see the smell right away. And half the people won't even notice there is a smell. And the people think they don't know how to smell. They know how to smell. They just don't notice. And I'm sure a painter notices more things visually than me. You know, if you're a visual person, you notice things. You say, oh, did you notice there is this in the tree? And I'll be like, oh, yeah, now that you're seeing it. Yeah. Voila. If there are no smell, I don't put them in there. If there's no smell, I notice that there's no smell. And I'm like, oh, it, should be, it would be much nicer with the smell. This I notice too. Do you have any smell memories, like something from your childhood maybe, or a certain moment, I don't know, when you were like in your uh, 20s, something? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, we all have plenty of smell memories. It's like I would tell you, do you have visual memories? You would say, yes, of course we have visual memories, and of course we have smell memories. I'm sure you have smell memories. You have to practice that, that's why. But what is my oldest smell memory? The beach I was like four Then I remember the Alps as well. I remember the smell of the cake that my mother was making. I remember the coriander leaves that she was using. I remember... Well, you don't have smell memories. I can't say that uh, I remember something particular. Maybe if I smell something, I remember, okay, it smells like my grandmother's kitchen. Maybe like this, but not in the sense that I would sit and remember something with the smell. Maybe because I have never paid much attention to that. I actually had very simple perfumes. Just after our conversation, I'm going to go to my wife's closet and going to get some perfume and just try it and smell it, play with it a little But bit. See, the sense of smell is not just perfumes, huh? I'm sure you, remember, you don't remember the smell of the car of your grandfather, for instance, or the smell of all of the bicycle or the smell of the tires. You don't remember the smell of the tires when you have a puncture. You do the bicycle and there's a puncture, there's a flat tire. You have to repair that. The smell of the glue and the smell of the tire. Or where were you as a kid? You were in the city or the smell of things you hated or things you liked very much. Smell is much more than just perfumes of people eh, or houses. In fact, I'm going to tell you, your sense of smell is six months older than you are. So you're 32, your sense of smell is 32 and a half because it opens up in the womb of your mother. After three months, when you are fetus like this in the womb of your mother, after three months, your nostril, your, uh, your nostril opens, the liquid circulates and your nose is active already. The cells are active. Well, I don't remember how it smells in the belly of my mother. I don't remember that. <laughs> But we know that the baby reacts to smells that are in the liquid of the mother. This we know. Now, how do you remember what smell it was? But it could also be, imagine your mother being attacked and your mother yelling and shouting. And imagine at that point you have garlic in the liquid of your mother, or a fish, or, you know, whatever she ate that day. I wouldn't be surprised that sometimes you feel uncomfortable about some things. It could be that it's a memory from that far back. But you see, you said yourself, when you go somewhere, clack, you have a memory open. That's exactly what I said.
I can talk to you about your house for three hours or your grandmother's house for three hours, and then you go somewhere like, oh, and then you remember something else in the house. The smell will open memories you cannot open with other with words. And this was demonstrated scientifically. Huh? So yes, yeah, so smell, 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 and you have more memories coming. That's also why I said psychologists. So you can go to psychologists for five years. You know, they like to say, oh, it takes a long time and talk and talk and talk on the, on the sofa, the psychologists, you know? Well, some of it, you can talk and talk and talk and talk. You will still not remember certain key facts of your life. So psychologists should have all a kit of smells, you know, and they should say, well, can you smell this? Or like this. So can you, can you smell that? The patient would smell and the patient would say, oh my God, but this I remember now, this is like my father doing this. Can you imagine the enrichness for the psychologist or just for the patient? You know that learning a foreign language is good gymnastic for the brain. It makes you more intelligent. You know, it's the same. You learn a new language by the smell and also with smells, you learn new words because we have a very rich vocabulary in perfumery. Yeah, we have a lot of words that we use. We have to use to describe smells. And people are also fascinated by the way we, the way we describe smell. Actually, you as a, I don't know, what are you? You're a journalist or you're a documentalist, an animator? I don't know what you are, actually. But you know that words are very important and we have a rich vocabulary. That's also fascinating, how we use words, how they come to describe things. I'm really curious about this psychology thing you started telling me about. Do you think there have to be particular smells in the kit of a psychiatrist or psychologist? Yes. I would say if you were a psychologist, I would have about 40, 50 smells. If you get a little bit more advanced, you would have 100 smells. And that would, be, that would already be plenty, plenty. But already 20 is not enough, maybe, but 40, 50 smells. It would be better if you had 40 or 50, because in there, you should have some citrus, you should have some sweet things, you should have wood, you should have something that comes up a lot also, a nice soap, you should have two or three perfumes, you should have maybe the smell of plastic or the smell of glue. If you're a psychologist, you should certainly have the smell of alcohol. When I say alcohol, like a liqueur or a wine, and you should have the smell of two or three drugs. You should have the smell of marijuana, cocaine, and another popular drug. The smell. And you won't believe the stories you get from people. And I'm going to say something that people have never explored, and I'm really upset about that, because me, I do that. I, I've done the smell officially of drugs for the museum in Grasse, and for Asuline. Maybe you know the publisher, the French publisher, Asuline. They asked me to do the smell of cocaine for a candle. The fascinating thing for me was, so I do the smell. So yes, I have to find cocaine someplace and I have to smell it without inhaling because I don't believe in being high and creating. I don't believe in this. So everybody says when you're high, you're more creative. I don't believe in that. So. Me, if I work on a drug, I don't do it. So yes, you have to smell it and it has a certain smell. But then what I do, I did the same with opium. I ask people around, so some I know they use that drug, so I check with them if that reminds them properly of the drug. And some, I don't know, but they want to smell. And I did not know so that everybody wants to smell. Oh, you have the smell of cocaine, show me. And then people smell, it opens areas in your brains and then people become like children. They cannot control. I didn't mention that. But when you smell, the first one or two seconds, you cannot control. That's also specific to the sense of smell. If I touch you, you control. If I, well, you have the reflex also. But this is a danger reflex. But let's say if you see something or if you hear something, first it's controlled by the brain. And then you can choose your reaction. The first one or two seconds is not controlled, it's not filtered by the brain, it goes straight to emotion and memory. The first one or two seconds, and then unlike a drug, then you can decide what to do. Then you become an adult and then it's filtered. And the reason goes over and then to, voila. But the first one or two seconds, emotion, memories, it's like this. And so people smell the cocaine and they're like, 
you can see people that I never thought they would do cocaine or people that never thought they knew about opium. And then up, they tell you their stories and really candidly. So as a perfumer, you are a psychologist and as a perfumer, people tell you stories they would not even tell their husband, their wives, their best friends. You hear a lot of stories when you're a perfumer, a lot of private, confidential, weird or not weird stories that they would not tell anybody, but just by smelling. Christophe, yeah. my wife is a psychologist like for many, many years. Is there any way to order such a kit? Is there <laughs> any, how can it be arranged? I mean, for money, of course. I did that for kids and stuff and then, I would have to make some more, and, but no, her as a psychologist, first of all, tell her exactly what I said. Tell her to go to have in her practice some things that smell that she can keep for a few things she can buy at the supermarket that don't degrade so fast, or things she buys at the aromatherapy place, like some herbs, like lavender. Lavender, I get a lot of stories with lavender. I don't know why. But she can buy a lavender soap or a lavender oil or lavender, whatever. And this she can, it will remain fresh for six months to one year. She buys Coca-Cola and they can talk about Coca-Cola. Then the person will smell Coca-Cola and I guarantee you they will have other stories. Glue, you get stories. So she, she has a pot of glue or a tube and then she squeezes a little bit and she asks the person to smell it. She will get stories. And then some people won't get a story. People will be like, no, for me, yeah, it's glue, but no, like, okay, fine, that's fine. And then she tries another one. So depending, so the thing is, depending on the stories she hears, the environment of the person, she shows one smell or another. And you don't show 50 smells to one person. It's not what I mean. Huh? She should have 50 props. And then depending on the stories she hears, she should show one or she should show another one. And I guarantee you, she will get stories. She will have clean laundry. I get stories. And perfume, she should have two or three masculine fragrances, very different, a fresh one and a sweet one. And same for women, a fresh one for women and an old one or a heavy one or a woody one, spicy, and then a floral one. I guarantee you the story she's going to get from the people. She won't believe the stories. And it goes on and on. People won't stop. They won't stop. I was with my father and this happened and that happened. And it's very precise and very complete. It's amazing. It's amazing, and Christophe. We can do another session. Maybe you can think and maybe we can do another session if you want. Maybe you're going to come to Russia someday. Do you plan to come to Russia? Like right now, no, I love Russia. I really love Russia. So I really, I need to go again. I don't, I don't have any plans, but when I'm in Berlin, it's very easy. It's very cheap and very easy. So I just have to put my ass on the plane and I go. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thanks.